Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Fantastic Voyage 2, Destination Brain, his long-awaited sequel to the classic Fantastic Voyage by Isaac Asimov. As always, I'm going to share the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So let's jump into the blurb. Dane reads... Journey to the centre of the mind. Comrade Pyotr Shaparov is a secret of vital importance to world science, but the only man with the skill to extract it from his comatose brain is American scientist Albert Jonas Morrison. Natalia Boronova, sent by the Russian High Command to get Morrison's help, will stop at nothing to ensure his cooperation, but there is one major problem, the necessity for human miniaturization. Wrenched from a routine conference and transported to a vast underground Soviet city dedicated to scientific experiment, Morrison is shrunk to a microscopic fraction of normal size and placed in a specially designed submarine. Injected into Shapirov's veins to travel deep into the uncharted regions of the brain, with only 12 hours to accomplish his task, Morrison embarks on a desperate search for the origins of thought itself. Fantastic Voyage 2 is Isaac Asimov's stunning sequel to the classic film and book Fantastic Voyage. It is destined to become an SF classic in its own right. No, it's not. So, the issue, the film came first, right, and then Asimov wrote the novelization, which was the first Fantastic Voyage book. This isn't a sequel, this is just Asimov doing what he would have done if he'd had the idea and hadn't been constrained to writing a novelization. With the result that a, a good half of this book is just the build up to it and like the, 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 you know, the diplomatic intrigue between the Soviets and the US and whatnot. So actually, the actual Fantastic Voyage, it's not really a big part of the book. It's probably like an, it almost feels like an afterthought. So in my ranking, uh, Fantastic Voyage, the novelization was my favorite, then the film, and then like way down is this. It doesn't really need to exist. I don't know why it does. And I don't know why it's being marketed as a sequel when it's more of a reimagining, I suppose. But anyway, uh, we start with a note. Uh, Asimov always likes to provide a little commentary on his work. So this is his note on it. He says, in 1966, my novel Fantastic Voyage was published. It was actually a novelization of a motion picture that had been written by others. I followed the plot line that existed as closely as I could, except for changing several of the more insupportable scientific inconsistencies. I was never quite satisfied with the novel, although it did very well and is still in print in both hardcover and paperback editions, simply because I never felt it to be entirely mine. When the opportunity arose to write another novel on the same theme, a miniaturized vessel with a crew that is inside a living human being, I agreed only on condition that I do it entirely my own way. Here then is Fantastic Voyage 2. A motion picture may be made from it, but if so, this novel will owe nothing at all to it. For better or for worse, this novel is mine. For worse, mate. Sorry, Isaac. I am a fan of your stuff. And so uh, this kind of shows you the time period this is set in. I believe it's actually set in the 21st century, even though it was published in 1987. Um, so there's still the Cold War going on and we get, um, her last sentence had been Russian. So had Morrison's reply. The change of language made no difference to him. He could speak and understand it as easily as English. That had to be so. If an American wished to be a scientist and keep up with the literature, he had to be able to handle Russian, almost as much as a Russian scientist had to be able to handle English. This woman, Natalia Boronova, for instance, despite her pretense that she was not at home in English, spoke it readily and with only a faint accent, Morrison noticed. She said, why will we sound like spies? There are hundreds of thousands of Americans speaking English in the Soviet Union and hundreds of thousands of Soviet citizens speaking Russian in the United States. These are not the bad old days. And then we get this as well. Uh, I know a great deal about you, when and where you were born, your schooling, the fact that you were divorced and that you have two daughters that live with your ex-wife. I know about your university position and the research you do. Morrison shrugged. None of that would be hard to find out in our computer-ridden society. And uh, bear in mind this was before the rise of the World Wide Web as well, so the internet existed, but very much in its fledgling state and uh, the web didn't exist. And so here we get a little bit of the science behind miniaturization. So we get, impossible, what if I told you we'd accomplish the task? I would as soon believe you if you told me polar bears fly. Why should I lie to you? I point out the fact, I'm not concerned about the motivation. Why are you so certain miniaturization is impossible? If you reduce a man to the dimensions of a fly, then all the mass of a man would be crowded into the volume of a fly. You'd end up with a density of something like, he paused to think, 150,000 times that of platinum. But what if the mass were reduced in proportion? Then you end up with one atom in the miniaturized man for every three million in the original. The miniaturized man would not only have the size of a fly, but the brain power of a fly as well. And if the atoms are reduced to, if it is miniaturized atoms you're speaking of, then Planck's constant, which is an absolutely fundamental quantity in our universe, forbids it. Miniaturized atoms would be too small to fit into the graininess of the universe. 
And if I told you that Planck's constant was reduced as well, so that a miniaturized man would be encased in a field in which the graininess of the universe was incredibly finer than it is under normal conditions, then I wouldn't believe you. So here we learn about some of the potential consequences of miniaturization. So it says, that it may be of course that if miniaturization becomes sufficiently successful, the Soviet Union may achieve a lead in the development of a space-centered society. Think of transporting miniaturized material from one world to another, of sending a million colonists in a spaceship that would house only two or three human beings of normal size. Space will acquire a Soviet colouring, a Soviet tinge, not because the Soviet people will dominate and be masters, but because Soviet thought will have won in the battle of ideas. And there's a guy who keeps sharing these like little aphorisms that his father said, so here he says, my father used to say apes were invented because politicians were needed. And uh, we also get this little bit as well. Um, the grotto, said Boronova, is located inside that. It gives us all the room we want, frees us from the vagaries of weather, and is impenetrable from aerial surveillance, even from spy satellites. Spy satellites are illegal, said Morrison indignantly. It is merely illegal to call them spy satellites, shot back Desnev. And uh, Desnev is the guy whose father has all these sayings, so he also says, As my old father used to say, the trouble with economising is that it can be very expensive. And Des Desnev, he also says, I had to work for an hour this morning to persuade them to allow a small additional experiment for your benefit. May the committee catch the cholera. Morrison said, the cholera no longer exists, even in India. May it be reinstated for the committee. If you've ever worked with a committee, you will know the truth of that. And then Desnev says, Besides, as my old father used to say, it is good to be at the head of the table, even if only one other sits with you and there is but a bowl of cabbage soup to share. And a trigger warning for uh, sexual assault and rape as well. And um, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel too comfortable with what this character says because she's sort of apologetic about the fact that she reported a rape. She says, He may choose to think I asked for it, but it's all on the record and the rapist is still in prison. Soviet law is hard on offenders of this type, but only if the situation can be thoroughly proven. I recognise the fact that women can falsely accuse men of rape, but this was not one of these situations and Yuri knows it. It's very, very rare, let's put it like that. The only time you ever hear of women falsely accusing men of rape is when rape apo rapist apologists are like, oh yeah, well, lots of women lie about it. It's like, no, they don't, mate. Just because you are the kind of douchebag who would lie about it doesn't make most women a douchebag, you know? I think most women are sensitive enough to knowing how awful rape is that they wouldn't lie about that kind of thing. We get a reference to, uh, or it might all be simply the will to believe, the same will that had led Percival Lowell to see canals on Mars. And actually, isn't it that the word was never canal? I can't remember. It was it was a translation thing anyway. He never, the guy who spotted canals on Mars never called them canals. And then uh, the woman who was sexually assaulted, um, what's her name? It's Russian, so Kalinin, I think. No, it's Natalia. She looked at him furiously but continued to whisper, of course I'm afraid. What do you think I am? It isn't sensible not to be afraid when you have rational reason for it. I was afraid when I was violated. I was afraid when I was pregnant and deserted. I've spent half my life being afraid. Everyone does. That's why people drink as much as they do, to wipe out the fear that grips them. She was virtually hissing through clenched teeth. Do you want me to be sorry for you because you're afraid? No, muttered Morrison, taken aback. There's nothing remarkable about being afraid, she went on, as long as you don't act afraid, as long as you don't let yourself be twisted into doing nothing because of fear, into having hysterics because of fear, into failing. She interrupted herself in a bitter, whispered self-accusation. I've had hysterics in my time. Her glance flickered in the direction of Konev, whose back was straight, stiff and motionless. But now, she went on, I intend to do my part even if I am half dead with fear. No one will tell from my actions that I'm afraid. And that better be your case too, Mr. American. And then we discover kind of one of the problems as well. Because um, they could theoretically use this to make faster than light travel possible, but then there's another problem, so... How would you guide it, said Morrison seriously. As soon as the ship swoops down onto the proper sizelessness and masslessness, it will, in effect, radiate outwards at hundreds of light years per second. That means that if there were trillions of ships, they would shoot out in every direction with spherical symmetry like sunlight. But since there would only be one ship, it would move outwards in one particular direction, but in an absolutely unpredictable one. That's a problem for the clever theoreticians like Yuri. Conev had not indicated any interest in the conversation up to that point, but now he snorted loudly. Morrison said, I'm not sure that it's wise to develop the travelling and carelessly assume the steering. Wouldn't your father say, a wise man does not build the roof of a house first? He might, said Arcady. But what he once did say was this, if you find a gold key without a lock, don't throw it away. The gold is also sufficient. And then Boronova says, we cannot even now make the automation equivalent to the versatility and ingenuity of a human brain. And bearing in mind this was 
written in the late 80s and set in the early 21st century, pretty much spot on because we still can't do that. Even machine learning, it can do some stuff better than a human brain, but it can't do everything a human brain does, you know? So another quote here from Desnev Senior. In life, unlike chess, the game continues after checkmate. I just particularly like that because I've been playing a lot of chess recently as well. I play it in bed and we get this. Uh, Desnev says, it is my opinion that I am absolutely certain. The trouble is that my opinion isn't always right. My father used to say, I think we ought to try it out, said Koyev, cutting off Desnev's father, perhaps in the full realisation he was doing so. Of course, said Desnev, that goes without saying. But as my father used to say, he raised his voice as though determined not to be again subverted. The sure thing about anything that goes without saying is that someone is bound to say it. It's weird that the most interesting bits for this are the quotes from Desnev Senior, who's not even here. Like, he's never a character in it. It's just his quotes and his wisdom. So here again, those who say a penny for your thoughts are usually being over generous, Desnev Senior. And then again, Desnev goes, I don't blame you. As my father used to say, the longer it takes to get to a point, the blunter it turns out to be. Which is why this novel is very blunt. Oh, and they managed to read this guy's thoughts and he's thinking Hawking and, uh, so, and Dejnev goes, out of nowhere it popped into my mind. You told me to tell you anything that did. It is an English word, said Boronova, that means spitting or selling, said Morrison cheerfully. Dejnev said, I don't know enough English to know that word. I thought it was someone's name. So it was, said Konev uncomfortably. Stephen Hawking, he was a great English theoretical physicist of a century ago. I was thinking of him too, but I thought it was my own thought. And I wonder whether it's going to be anything to do with Hawking radiation. I don't think it's yet been explained. And, um... I only have a little bit to go. So another Desnev quote, he says, as my father used to say, anyone can hunt a bear fearlessly when the bear is absent. More Desnev, he goes, as my father once said, life would be unbearable if death were not worse yet. Oh, here's a page I tapped three things out on. So Desnev, he goes, we beat a dead horse here. We've consumed our energy supply as though it were vodka at a wedding. And then later on, he goes, my poor old father used to say, the most frightening phrase in the Russian language is, that's odd. Koz Konev turned angrily and said, shut up, Arkady. Desnev replied, I mentioned that only because it is now time for me to say, that's odd. And then another Desnev dad quote, he goes, my father used to say, it is more important to know the thing than the name. So you get this like, great little bit here, another one of the uh, father saying so. Konev says, well then, since there is only one way in which we can head, we will head in that direction. I'm sure that Arkady's father had a saying concerning that. Desnev said at once, he used to say, when only one course of action is possible, there is no difficulty in deciding what to do. And we get this little conversation. Uh, so Morrison says to Kalinin, how long were we on the ship? I think it was over 11 hours, said Kalinin. Morrison shook his head. I think it was over 11 years. I know, she said, smiling slightly, but clocks lack imagination. One of Desnev's senior's aphorisms, Sophia. No, one of my own. And here we get, uh, the main course at the dinner was a roast goose of enormous size, which Desnev carved saying, be abstemious, my friends. For as my father used to say, eating too much kills more quickly than eating too little. Having said this, he served himself a much larger helping than he served anyone else. And the final bit that I want to highlight here. I hate that woman, muttered Kalinin as they walked up the flight of stairs to Morrison's second floor room. Do you think that she is an observer of this place on behalf of the central government? asked Morrison. Who knows? But there is something wrong with her. She is possessed by a devil of impudence. She does not know her place. Her place? Are there class distinctions then in the Soviet Union? Don't be sarcastic, Albert. There are supposedly none in the United States either, but you have them, surely, and so do we. I know what the theory is, but no person can live by theory alone. If Arcady's father didn't say that, he should have. So yeah, overall, Fantastic Voyage 2 Destination Brain, I'm still not convinced this needed to exist. And I feel like Asimov could have written something better if he'd been putting his time towards that instead of this. Uh, the first Fantastic Voyage book was superior to this one. Um, even though it was a movie novelization, there was just too much bloating in this and too much of the political side which didn't really matter to me. Especially now that like the Soviet Union is no more and stuff, it just felt a little bit less relevant. It would have been less relevant even when Asimov was writing it because it was just before the fall of the Berlin Wall and all this stuff. So the Soviets had already been kind of declining in power. And in fact, in his vision of the 21st century, the Soviets and, and the United States are working much more closely together. Um, I mean, some of the character work was good. Desnev's dad was the single best thing about this book, and he's not actually in it, it's just his quotes. Um, so that kind of says a lot about it, really. So overall, I'll give it a very, very weak 3.5 out of 5. Not quite a 3, but only just by the skin of its teeth. 
So there we have it, that's what I made of Fantastic Voyage 2 Destination Brain by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.